the author said, the Madhabs, schools of Ahlul Sunnah. Question three, what is the correct position concerning following a school? In reality, Ahlul Sunnah is the vast, vast majority of Muslims. They stuck to the same belief since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and never deviated from it. Concerning the practical rules, fiqh, Ahlu Sunnah follows the four famous madhabs in obedience to Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, without disputing the validity of any of them, despite the differences among them. This means that Ahlu Sunnah follows the schools of Islamic law. Those schools agree about the fundamental beliefs and the fundamental rules. So you know about the fundamental beliefs, we talked about that. And the fundamental rules means the basics that they don't disagree about, which is most of the religion. And they differ about some of the details of the rules, like if reciting the Fatiha is obligatory on the follower in the prayer, or if the Imam's recitation is enough for the follower, or if one must make the intention at night to fast the following day, or if it is enough to make the intention on the first night for the entire month, etc. It is important to know that in the past, there were other valid schools, like the schools of Al-Awza'i, Al-Layth, the two Sufyans, as well as other Mujtahids. But these four are the remaining schools. The followers of these schools took great care to document their schools and pass them down to the following generations. The largest of those four schools is the Hanafi school, the followers of the great Persian Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Malik was a contemporary of his and the greatest scholar in the city of Al Madinah at his time. His school, the Maliki school, is the most widely spread in Africa, with the exception of the Eastern African countries. Imam al-Shafi'i, the scholar of Quraysh, was the greatest student of Malik, and his school, the Shafi'i school, is the most common in the areas of Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Jordan, as well as Indonesia and Malaysia. But many Syrians are Hanafi. As for the Hanbali school, the followers of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, it is the smallest of the four because many of the people who likened Allah to the creations attributed themselves to that school and have defamed it, repelling people from adhering to it. So let's back up. The largest of those four schools is the Hanafi school. And the reason for the, um, the great reach of the Hanafi school, as I learned, is that the Ottomans were Hanafis. So that was the madhab of the Caliph, or the Caliphate. That was the school of the Caliphate. So um, that was a reason for that madhab to get propagated strongly. And the Hanafi school has a particular merit, which is that according to the saying that Imam Abu Hanifa is a tabi'i, it is said that Imam Abu Hanifa is a tabi'i among the, the tabi'un, the followers of the companions, then his madhab is a madhab from the tabi'un. He's a tabi'i, according to that saying, so that gives his madhab um, something special. MashaAllah. And Imam Malik, also his madhab has something special, which is that is the madhab of the city of Medina. That's the city of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Malik's madhab is the madhab of Medina. So that's a very special merit. And the Shafi'i school has a merit, which is that a Shafi'i, he learned the Hanafi school and he learned the Maliki school. Rahimahullah. He studied with the Hanafis and he studied with Imam Malik. And he studied with others also. And so he knew very well what he was accepting and what he was rejecting, mashaAllah. He had a great comparison of these madhabs as well as others. He was the scholar of Quraysh. He's called the scholar of Quraysh because it came in a hadith.
about the scholar of Quraysh whose knowledge would fill the earth. The scholar said this is probably a Shafi'i because there is no scholar from Quraysh whose knowledge filled the corners of the earth like a Shafi'i. And as for the Hanbali school, it is the smallest of the four because many of the people who likened Allah to the creations attributed themselves to that school and they have defamed it. Remember, the majority of the Sunni Muslims were not people who likened Allah to the creations. They believed that, that Allah is not like his creations, that he's not in a place. So who are they encountering among the people who are claiming that Allah is in a place? People who are claiming to be Hanbalis. Frequently. Ibn Taymiyyah and before him and after him. Mushabbiha claiming the school of Imam Ahmad. So they defamed that madhab and they pushed people away from it. The Sunni Muslims are not inclined towards these people, these likeners. Just like we are not inclined towards them today, the Muslims in the past also were not inclined towards them. In fact, in some of the works of the scholars, they referred to the Mushabbiha, the likeners, as the Hanabila, the Hanbalis. This is only due to those people defaming the Hanbali school. And it is exactly like the people referring to the Wahhabis today as Salafis. They attribute themselves to the Salaf and they became famous as the Salafis. In the past, the Mushabbiha attributed themselves to the Hanbali school, so they became known as the Hanbalis. Yani the word, the name Hanbali became synonymous to Mushabbih, likener, one who likens Allah to the creations. So just as the likeners, Mushabbiha, should not be called Hanbalis or Hanabila, the Wahhabis should not be called Salafis, for this is a misrepresentation. Question 4. What if a Wahhabi claims that following a school is innovation and shirk, paganism? Here, to further clarify that Ahlul Sunnah are not deviant in their practice of the religion, we will take an opportunity to substantiate the validity of following the madhahib, the schools. Because this issue is one of the deviances of the Wahhabis. They say that following the schools is an innovation. Some of them even went as far as to say that it is shirk. Like one of them named Muhammad Siddiq Hassan al-Qinwaji, who died in the Islamic year of 1253, he said, and here his quote is missing, but we do have exactly his book and the page number and the publisher, Ad-Din al-Khalis, that's the name of his book, page 140, according to um, a publication of Darul Qutub al-Ilmiyyah. But we're lacking the quote, but, you know, any of you who knows how we do, we have the quote, mashallah, so. We just have to put it in there. So I don't have the quote here, but he said that it is shirk. Following madhabs is shirk. In their claim, the evidence from the Quran that following schools is shirk is the saying of Allah. So how could they say following schools is shirk? Now that you know, you understand well, what does it mean to follow a madhab? How could they say that following a madhab is shirk? They inferred that from the saying of Allah, They took their rabbis and monks as lords besides or instead of Allah. They would say about this, they would say, check the books of tafsir, Quran interpretation. And you will see that this verse dispraises the Jews and Christians for taking their rabbis, monks, and priests, and scholars as gods besides Allah, instead of Allah. And that the way they did so, how did they take their leaders as gods? The way they did so was by obeying them in what they deem lawful and unlawful. They say to us, this verse is applicable to you followers of the schools because you are obeying the imams and what they deem lawful or unlawful. So you have worshipped them just as the Jews and Christians worshipped their monks and rabbis. 
The answer to this fallacy is that their worship of their monks and rabbis was because they believed that they had, that their monks and rabbis had the right to deem things lawful and unlawful from themselves. That they believe, for example, if the Pope says this is lawful, then it is lawful because the Pope said it. And likewise, if he said something is unlawful. The Muslims do not believe that about the imams. We don't say this is lawful because a Shafi'i said so, or just because a Shafi'i said so. No, because a Shafi'i has to take that from an ayah of the Quran, right? Or a hadith of the Prophet. So the Muslims do not believe that about the Imams. That they have the right to make lawful or unlawful from themselves. And don't we say that if there's an explicit text in the Quran or the hadith, that the scholar has no room for any discussion in the first place? He has nothing to say. If the rule is explicitly mentioned in the Quran or the hadith, then what does the scholar have to say about whether it's the rule or not? He has nothing to say. Rather, our belief about them is that they are scholars who are qualified to extract judgments directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. If they are correct in what they have arrived at, they get two rewards, and if they are mistaken, they still get one reward. As it came in the hadith, إِذَا جِتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمُ فَأَصَابْ فَلَهُ أَجِرًا وَإِذَا جِتَهَدَ فَأَخْطَأَ فَلَهُ أَجِرًا If the ruler makes ijtihad and is correct, he has two rewards. If he makes it and is mistaken, he has one reward. Imam and nawawi commented on this hadith, saying, قَالَ الْعُلَمَاءِ The scholar said, أجمع المسلمون على أن هذا الحديث في حاكم عالم أهل للحكم. The scholars have a consensus that this hadith is concerning the ruler who is a scholar and qualified for giving verdict. فإن أصاب فله أجران. If he is correct, he has two rewards. أجر بجتهاده وأجر بإصابته. A reward for his determination. And a reward for his accuracy. وَإِنْ أَخْطَأَ فَلَهُ أَجِرٌ بِجْتِهَادِهِ If he is mistaken, he has one reward for his determination. Now this hadith is not restricted to a ruler. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned the ruler specifically in this hadith, not because one has to be a ruler to be a mujtahid, but because the ruler is the one who is most in need of being a mujtahid. And he is the mujtahid who will be making judgments because he's a ruler, as opposed to one who's just a scholar who's not a ruler. Yes, he will be also making ijtihad, but you understand the difference between their positions. But this hadith also applies to the scholar who's not a ruler. In other words, this hadith is not about that ruler because he's a ruler. The Prophet didn't mention that ruler because he's a ruler. He mentioned that ruler in this hadith because he was a scholar, mujtahid. So the hadith applies to the mujtahids in general and to the rulers in particular because of their need of that. Then he continued to say, meaning Imam al Nawawi, in his commentary on this hadith. Qalu, Amma man laysa bi ahlin lil hukum, fala yahillu lahu al hukmu, fa in hakama, fala ejira lahu, bal hua athimun, wala yan fudu hukmu. Sawa un wafak al hakka amla, li anna isa betahu tifakiya. ليست صادرة عن أصل شرعي فهو عاص في جميع أحكامه سواء وافق الصواب أم لا وهي مردودة وهي مردودة كلها ولا يعذر في شيء من ذلك They said as for the one who is not qualified to give verdict it is not lawful for him to give verdict Thus, if he rules, he has no reward, the one who's not qualified. Instead, he is sinful and his verdict is not executed. 
whether it agreed with the truth or not, because his accuracy is merely coincidence. It did not issue forth from a legal basis. Therefore, he is sinful in all of his verdicts, whether they complied with the truth or not, and they are rejected entirely, and he is not excused for any of that. Question 5. Did the Prophet wasallam and his companions follow schools? If not, then why should we? Out of their ignorance and lack of understanding the issue, that is the issue of following madhabs, the issue of following mujtahids, knowing what is a mujtahid and what is a muqallid, an imitator, so out of their ignorance and lack of understanding the issue, some ask, did the Prophet ﷺ follow a school? The answer to that silly question is no, he did not follow a school. The schools follow him. That's a silly question when the person who's asking is being stubborn. As for a person who is truly at zero knowledge and is asking for understanding, then the it's not a silly question and the answer is no. He did not follow a school. The schools follow him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This means that the schools use the hadiths of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as evidence. He is the messenger of Allah. He wouldn't be following a school. He's following the revelation from Allah ta'ala. However, sometimes they differ about the laws they arrive at from those hadiths and from the Qur'an. It means... The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he speaks from the revelation. Whether that revelation was Qur'an or that revelation was the sunnah. So the qualified scholars, they use those hadiths and ayahs of the Qur'an as evidence for rules. They deduce from these texts rules. And sometimes they differ about the rules they differ about the conclusions that they come to. This is why a better term than school of thought, as many say, is school of law, because they deal with how to implement what the Prophet ﷺ came with, according to the legal opinions of qualified jurist scholars, fuqaha. Let's read that again. This is why a better term than school of thought as many say, and I'm not saying school of thought is wrong, is school of law. Because they, meaning the madhabs, the schools, they deal with how to implement what the Prophet ﷺ came with according to the legal opinions of qualified jurist scholars, fuqaha. So, for a person who has a bigger idea of how things go. I mean, not a person who thinks that religion is as simple as opening books and making your own understanding. Reading the Quran, reading the hadiths, like, like a Christian would just open the Bible and read it and make his own interpretations, and like this. And he doesn't really have any rules, actually. Few, few rules, religious rules, very few. Rather, for someone who understands how things go, actually, there are scholars with very high levels of knowledge who deduce rules from these texts and they sometimes differ. We'll see some examples. If a person does not find it strange that even in a non-Islamic society or government, there would be judges who are deducing from something and coming up with different answers, with different rulings sometimes. Whoever doesn't find that strange shouldn't find what we are saying strange. What's actually strange is that those people are deducing rules based on the opinions of other men. Some human beings uh, made a constitution, and then other people rallied around this constitution and supported it, and they start deducing rules from the opinions of men, which is this constitution. So the scholars aren't doing that.
they are deducing rules from the Quran and from the Sunnah as qualified ulama, qualified scholars. Therefore, Ahlul Sunnah believes that if someone follows any one of those madhabs, he would be guided. By that, they respect the acceptable differences within the boundaries of the Islamic law, Sharia, as validated by the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and just as the companions and their students respected the different judgments given by different mujtahid companions. So yes, the companions did follow schools. If the Prophet ﷺ were available, they would ask him and get the definitive answer. If he was not, they would ask the mujtahid companions among them, those who were qualified to deduce rules directly from the Qur'an and the Hadiths. They sometimes differed in their answers, and then it would be permissible to follow any of them, any of those companions. In essence, this is exactly the case of following the schools. However, the rulings of the companions were not preserved as completely as the rulings of the imams of the four schools. Therefore, although we know some of the rulings and positions of Umar, Aisha, Ibn Abbas, and other mujtahid companions, we cannot follow what would be their schools because they were not documented and preserved. Therefore, although we know some of the rulings and positions of Umar, Aisha, Ibn Abbas, and other mujtahid companions, we cannot follow what would be their schools because they were not documented and preserved. That doesn't mean you can't follow a saying of Ibn Abbas or Aisha or Umar. When, when it says here, we can't follow what would be their schools, it means that the madhab of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the complete madhab of Umar ibn al-Khattab is not available. And the same for Aisha and Ibn Abbas and other mujtahid companions. Some of their sayings, their ijtihads, are preserved, but their madhabs are not preserved. It could be that their madhabs, some of them were never documented, actually, but they had madhabs, they had ijtihad. The same was done during the time of the followers of the companions. The documentation of the schools started after that. Scholars like Imam Abu Hanifa and Ash-Shafi'i had dedicated students who documented everything they said, studied their methods, and conveyed their schools to the next generation in a complete fashion. Had the schools of the companions reached us, we could follow them like we follow the four. Question six. Do you have evidence for following schools? Clear evidence from the incidents that took place between the companions at the time of the Prophet ﷺ is what Al-Bukhari narrated from the route of Ibn Umar. An Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu annahu qala, qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lana lamma raja'a min al-ahzab la yusalliyan ahadun al-asra illa fi bani kurayudah. فأدرك بعضهم العصر في الطريق فقال بعضهم لا نصلي حتى نأتيها وقال بعضهم بل نصلي لم يرد منا ذلك فذكر للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فلم يعنف واحدا منهم From the route of Ibn Umar that he said when he returned from the battle against the United Parties the Prophet ﷺ told us, no one prays Al-Asr until reaching Bani Qurayzah. Those were some Jews who had broke their treaty with the Muslims. Some of them were en route when the Asr prayer came in. Some said, we do not pray until we get there. Some of them said, no, we shall pray. That is not what he wanted from us. Meaning, what you understand is not what the Prophet meant, alayhi salatu wasalam. That was later mentioned to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he did not scold any one of them. 
The evidence in this hadith is that some mujtahid companions understood the apparent expression of the Prophet وسلم, and thus took it to be permission to pray Asr outside of its time if it meant praying it only at their destination. لا يصلين أحد العصر إلا في بني كريضة. No one prays Asr except at Bani كريضة. So they said the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said, "Don't pray until you get there. We're not there, so we're not going to pray." Others understood that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was telling them to rush to their destination, so to pray the prayer in its time there but not to pray the prayer outside of its time. Meaning, if it were a choice between praying Asr out of its time at Bani Qurayva or praying it on time, if there was no way to pray it on time at Bani Qurayva, then we still have to stop to pray Asr. What he meant was hurry up and get there and pray on time. Had their difference been unacceptable, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have scolded those who disobeyed him. Because the belief of the Muslims is that the Prophet وسلم, does not remain silent in the face of sins. This difference that occurred between the companions is the exact difference between the schools. Some understood a hadith this way, while others that way. Some referred to a hadith while others did not confirm its authenticity, etc. But most importantly, all of those mujtahids were qualified. Thus, Ahlu Sunnah, unlike the Wahhabis, follow the companions in what they did in reference to imitation, taqlid of scholars and following schools. As a result, they, meaning Ahlu Sunnah, did not tamper with the rules of the religion. More will be mentioned about the validity of following the schools in the section about the Wahhabi grandfather, Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah. Question 7. Who are the Ash'aris and the Maturidis? All of Ahlu Sunnah have the same basic belief, even if their schools of law vary. They belong to one of two madhabs of aqidah, creed or belief. Even if some laymen do not realize that, they might not realize that the way they know religion is through the maturidis or through the ash'aris. And they wouldn't realize that because they may not have been people who studied the knowledge, but they were laymen. The, the knowledge reached them as laymen without them discerning who are the speakers of this knowledge, who are the sayers of that knowledge. Just like a person might have grown up practicing Maliki school, he never knew he was practicing any school. Or Hanafi school, he might have been growing up in Africa learning Maliki school with no idea. Maybe growing up in Pakistan, and he grew up as a Hanafi and had no idea. When dealing with Wahhabis, knowing about this is important. In brief, the two madhabs of Aqidah do not have different creeds. They carry the same basic belief. For this reason, it is valid to say that the Ash'ari is a Maturidi and the Maturidi is an Ash'ari. I apologize for the lack of consistency in the transliteration, but it's still a draft, as you can see the watermark. That's what our Sheikh taught us, and that's what the ulama said, that it is valid to call the Maturidi an Ash'ari and to call the Ash'ari a Maturidi. The difference between them is almost entirely in terminology. In other words, the base of these two schools is the same, and the outcome they reached in regards to the belief is the same. What's their base? The Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Islamic bases. What's the outcome they reached? The same belief as the companions, and the same belief as each other. Their differences are in issues like defining terms. If someone follows one of the schools of Aqidah, whether the Ash'ari school or the Maturidi, 
He follows the belief of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions, just as the one who follows the method of the previously mentioned schools of fiqh follows the method of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions. Question eight: If their belief is the same, why have two different schools? And if they have two different schools, how could they both be the guided faction, the one guided faction? The Maturidis and the Ash'aris are only two different schools because they were established by two different men in two different areas. However, both men had the same belief. Naturally, being different individuals, they would differ in their terminology and expressions, even if their belief were the same. Then the scholars who came after them applied the method of those two scholars and taught according to their ways out of confession that those two scholars were the masters of their time in the science of the creed. Just as Al-Bukhari and Muslim were the masters in hadith narration. Now that doesn't mean that Al-Bukhari and Muslim were the greatest hadith scholars ever. Just like Al-Ash'ari and Al-Maturidi are not the greatest Aqidah scholars ever. But they have a very high status in this knowledge. So high, they were so good that the scholars who came after them, and they were scholars, mind you, they recognized the superiority of these particular imams and they followed them. They followed their way. The scholars who came after them applied the method of those two scholars and taught according to their ways, out of confession that those two scholars were the masters of their time in the science of the creed, just as Al-Bukhari and Muslim were the masters in hadith narration. And it's true that in the books of hadith terminology, the scholars love Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Almost everything they do centers around Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And the four imams were the masters of fiqh. Thus, anyone who took by the way of al-Ash'ari in expressing the matters of the creed was attributed to his school. Likewise, is said about whoever taught and authored according to the way of al-Maturidi. Furthermore, it is valid to say that whoever is an Ash'ari is a Maturidi, and whoever is a Maturidi is an Ash'ari. Meaning, it's valid to overlook that terminology in the first place. The belief is the same. The answer to the second question is that the fact that they share the same basic creed confirms that both groups are the guided faction. Just as the companions who had the same basic creed differed about whether the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Allah or not. Some, like Ibn Abbas, said that he saw Allah with his heart. Others, like Aisha, said that he did not see Allah. Some of Ahlu Sunnah, not the companions, said that he saw Allah with his eyes. Yes, what is correct is that he saw Allah with his heart and not with his eyes. That it is possible that what Aisha meant by saying that he did not see Allah was that he did not see Allah with his eyes. And it is true that no one will see Allah with their eyes in this lifetime. The proof for which does not befit this summarized booklet. That would be a completely different subject, so we can't go into that. But the point is that this difference does not mean that the companions have divided into factions. They all still have the same basic belief, which is that Allah can be seen. Likewise, the differing expressions between the Ash'aris and the Maturidis do not make them two different factions, because their basic creed is the same. Hence, what is precise is to say that they are two schools within the same guided faction. In explaining the Muslims' creed, most scholars like the Shafi'i and the Maliki scholars, are Ash'aris. They are also known as al Ash'arah. Others, usually Hanafi scholars, are Maturidis, and it should be known that they are not few. 
the Wahhabis hate both groups, claiming that Esha'aris and Maturidis are deviants. They are cornered into this claim, the Wahhabis are cornered into this claim, claiming that Esha'aris and Maturidis are deviants, because both fountains of knowledge refute the Wahhabi creed and all other creeds. So once the Wahhabis found these two groups standing against them, they had to, in their own minds, label them as deviants. But it's not because they are. They are not deviants, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. Furthermore, since they claim that the Ash'aris are deviant, and since most of the scholars are Ash'aris, they often quote scholars whom they would consider deviants. The clout of heavyweight scholars like an nawawi Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, and al-Bayhaqi give their books and lessons an authentic tone. Although in reality, such scholars refuted and disagreed with the Wahhabi beliefs. You see, for example, look at Ibn Uthaymin and all those Wahhabis explaining the books of An-Nawawi, explaining Riyadh al-Salihin, explaining 40 hadiths of An-Nawawi. And if you were to ask them about the Aqid of An-Nawawi, they say, well, he was an Ash'ari. And if you were to ask them, well, what do you say about the Ash'aris, they will say they are deviants. Why are they busying themselves with the books of the deviants in their claim? Because they have no one else but a very few number of people. Their own people, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's books and Ibn Al-Qayyim Al-Jawziyah's books, few other people, and otherwise, besides that, who do they have to refer to? Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. All those Asha'ira and Maturidiyya that they claim are deviants, they're um, explaining their books. Um, I heard part of a recording of uh, an explanation, a Wahhabi's explanation of al waraqat by Imam al haramain in Usul al-Fiqah. Imam al haramain as it was said, some, some said, was a, no a notorious Ash'ari. This is known about him who he was. So this Wahhabi, he said, as for Imam al haramain we believe about him that he repented. I'm paraphrasing. But what about Siyuti? What's his name? Um, Yasir Qadi. He has a book on um, sciences of Quran, Ulum al Quran, full of quotes of Ash'aris, full of them. I have a copy here in my house. Quoting the Ash'aris left and right, left and right, because he has no one else to quote. And where is he getting most of his information from anyway? From a Siyuti, known Ash'ari. He makes takfir on the mushabbiha. The cloud of heavyweight scholars like an nawawi Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, and al-Bayhaqi give their books and lessons an authentic tone, although in reality such scholars refuted and disagreed with the Wahhabi beliefs. Not necessarily naming the Wahhabis by name, if the Wahhabis didn't exist yet, but their beliefs had existed with one group or another in the past. The Wahhabis pick and choose what they like from the scholars' comments and judgments. But if one were to show them what those scholars believed, those Wahhabis would say, oh, but he is an Ash'ari. We take the good from him and leave the bad. His contributions to the nation far exceed his harm. That's how they justify, by talking like that. They say, we'll take his good and leave the bad. His contributions far exceed his harm. What's our answer to that? Our answer to that is, uh, but we follow them, and you you don't take from us anything. Those same ones that you said you take from them the good and leave from them the bad, we follow them. We do like they do. We are just like them. We are a sha'ira, just like a nawawi and a suyutli and all those imams that you are quoting. We're just like them. You don't take anything from us, and you warn against us. So where did, what happened there? The author said, question nine, who are the Atharis? Athari literally means related or pertaining to the Athar. And the Athar means the trace or the remnant, literally, refers to the hadiths and transmitted traditions. There is no school among Ahlu Sunnah called the Atharis. Rather, what the Wahhabis mean by claiming 
that there is a third school of belief, the Athari school. So they say there's the Ash'aris and the Maturidis and the Atharis. What they mean is that among Ahlu Sunnah, there is a group that adhered strictly to the literal meanings of the Athar, meaning the Hadiths. They made no ta'wil, and they took them by their apparent meanings. This is a lie. The so-called Atharis are no one other than the Mushabbiha, the Likeners. They are not a group of Ahlu Sunnah comparable to the Asha'irah and the Maturidiyah. And if Allah willed, we will give some history of the Likeners in the nation of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ahlu Sunnah, whether Hanafis, Malikis, Shafi'is, or Hanbalis, and whether Ash'aris or Maturidis, is moderate, safe between the different extremes that are and have been practiced. Unlike the Wahhabis, they do not liken the attributes of Allah to the attributes of the creations, nor do they deny the attributes or the existence of Allah as the Wahhabis would accuse them. They do not deem the intellect as something that has priority over the rules of Allah. They don't put their intellects over the revelation. That's what the Wahhabis would accuse them of, of giving their intellects priority over the rules. They don't do that. That's what the Mu'tazila do. Ahlu Sunnah doesn't do that. Nor do they stoop like the Wahhabis and read the Qur'an and the Hadiths without using their minds. It is said that the one who reads the revelation without using his mind is like the one who steps into the light with his eyes closed. And the one who uses his mind without using the revelation is like the one who steps into the darkness with his eyes opened. Memorize that one, it's nice. The one who reads the revelation without using his mind. So the revelation is the light and the mind is the eyes. Whoever reads the revelation without using his mind is like the one who steps into the light with his eyes closed. And the one who uses his mind without using the revelation is like the one who steps into the darkness with his eyes opened. We must step into the light with our eyes opened. We must accept the revelation of Allah and use our minds. What other than ignoring the mind allows a person to believe that the Creator literally has one side with two right hands, one foot, and one shin? The intelligent one would be sure that the references that they took literally that lead them to establish this deformed description must have a different meaning.